Good morning. My name is Brian Check, and I'm with the Center for the Advancement of the Steady State Economy. So our acronym is CASI. Uh, it's an honor to get a chance to address the forum. And I'd like to thank Brian Spees and, and Ian Sloan for the opportunity. I also want to give a shout out to a couple of CASI people in Australia. Jeff Mosley, our Director of Australian Operations and Hayden Washington, the director of our chapter in New South Wales. The title of my talk today is Steady State Economics, the Trophic Theory of Money, and GDP as an Indicator of Environmental Impact. In ecological economics, when we think about economic growth, we especially think about the throughput, the inputs of energy and, and stocks of natural capital, the production and consumption of goods and services, and the pollutants, material and waste heat as well. And so this is why we recognize a limit to economic growth. And so when we think about the steady state economy, we recognize that neither growth nor degrowth are sustainable. So the sustainable alternative is what we call the steady state economy. And it's not going to be a flatlined economy. It'll be mildly equilibrating, ideally somewhere around an optimal level. The question that we have, and I would say that this is the biggest, this has become the, the biggest controversy in sustainability dialogue, is when we think about that throughput, can we express that in terms of GDP? Uh, most neoclassical economists would say no, there's no linkage between throughput and GDP. GDP can be dematerialized. Uh, and I'm going to argue that yes, there is absolutely a linkage, and I'll argue this using what I call the trophic theory of money. GDP is a, a monetary, uh, a monetary indicator, it's put in monetary terms, and if we think of throughput in terms of GDP, might we take another step and think of it in terms of money, the amount of money uh, in some way. Now, money is a means of exchange, a unit of account, and a store of value. And it exists in the macroeconomy as a stock and as a flow. The stock of money is called the money supply, and monetary authorities and scholars recognize different types of money supply starting with M0, that's the base money that's issued by the central bank. And so those are the notes and coins in circulation or it deposited at the central bank. M1 or narrow money builds upon M0 with demand deposits, most notably checking accounts. And then there are additional types of money supplies that depart further from the base money uh, by adding additional types of accounts and financial instruments. Uh, and so as you get further from the base, you have, <coughs> excuse me, you have less liquidity. Our, the trophic theory of money is going to apply primarily to M0, the base money, but because all the money supplies are built on that base, it does apply as well to other types of money supplies. Not so much in the case of flows. With the trophic theory of money, we're concerned with gross domestic product. We're not concerned with the money flow index of the stock market or the cash flow index used in microeconomics. We're concerned with GDP, which is the monetary value of all final goods and services produced annually within a country's borders. Now, if you're not accustomed to thinking of GDP as a flow of money, consider the fundamental identity of national income accounting, which tells us that production equals income equals expenditure. <clears throat> income and expenditure are flows of money. Now, they're not flows of, uh, of any type for any purpose, 
the, we have to remember the definition of GDP. So the production and the income and the expenditure pertain to the final goods and services. So that's not GDP. It's not shuffling of money through slot machines or buying and selling of derivatives. You might say that GDP is the river, not the eddies and the oxbows. <coughs> now GDP and the money supply are related using a variable called the velocity of money, which is GDP divided by the money supply. And this is a, a short-term metric primarily. It's used as an indicator of consumer confidence and as a predictor of GDP in the short term. Velocity of money is thought to stay relatively constant in the long run. We'll come back to that. A theory of money should address questions like how does money originate? How does the quantity of money relate to the quantity of real economic output? Now, how is the quantity of money related to prices? Aristotle said, he who thus considers things in their first growth and origin will obtain the clearest view of them. So in that spirit, let's look at the first growth and origin of money. And three regions vie for the title of first, first money, origins of money. Mesopotamia, Lydia in ancient Greece, and China, in particular the Yellow River Basin, where shekels, electrum coins, and copper coins respectively evolved thousands of years ago. And prior to that money per se being developed, there were forms of proto-money which tended to be agricultural commodities or closely related natural resources. So now we're backtracking in time in investigating the origins of money and as we go back in time we notice something that the exact same places that are iconic for origins of money are also iconic for origins of something else namely agriculture especially Mesopotamia and the Yellow River Basin in China. And now we come to the trophic theory of money, which is that money originates via the agricultural surplus that frees the hands for the division of labor unto the manufacturing and service sectors. We call it the trophic theory of money because in the economy of nature there is a trophic structure with three basic levels. Producers are plants that produce food via photosynthesis. Primary consumers eat plants. Secondary consumers eat primary consumers. And these are the three basic levels. In detailed ecological assessment in trophic terms, trophic scores can also be developed for species depending on the degree of herbivory versus carnivory with omnivory in between. And some species uh, don't quite fit in basic trophic levels too readily, things like scavengers and decomposers, they're service providers. The human economy has the same st structure, it has to follow the same basic rules, and so at the base are the agro-extractive sectors, and it's the surplus there that allows for heavy manufacturing and it's the heavy manufacturing that allows for light manufacturing. Again, three basic trophic levels and detailed assessment would, uh, would allow us to have the equivalent of trophic scores as you proceed from heavy to the lightest type of manufacturing. And again, there are uh, certain economic activities that don't fit readily into the trophic levels, they're service providers, uh, but the one thing we know, just as in the economy of nature, those proliferate only at the, uh, when there is plenty of agro-extractive surplus at the base. So in other words, before any of this occurs, there's plenty of this. And the primary corollary of the trophic theory of money then 
is that the quantity of money and GDP, the flow, indicates the amount of agricultural surplus and related activity at the trophic base of the economy and therefore the environmental impact of the economy. So we can now envision the economy growing like this with its, uh, its whole trophic structure and uh, with the basic trophic level spreading out across the landscape. Uh, here are some, some real scenes, 21st century scenes from an expanding trophic base. Just going to rattle through these quickly and you can see for yourself, you're basically familiar with this type of activity. This is what it takes. It takes a lot of this. In the economy of nature, there's a rule of thumb that uh, you lose approximately 90% of biomass as you go from one trophic level to the next. And uh, so it takes plenty of surplus in the economy of nature to allow for uh, the buildup of trophic levels. And it's the same with the human economy. Plenty of, of this type of activity is needed to have the heavy manufacturing like this, which then allows for the light manufacturing like this and the service sectors including the information economy including people in these types of activities who are working for the other sectors in that trophic structure of the economy. Now you might say well what does all that have to do with GDP and the answer to that is everything. Just ask the Bureau of Economic Analysis because they're busy every day monitoring those sectors that we just looked at, those and others. They're monitoring the real economy and remember the fundamental identity of national income accounting. It's production equals income equals expenditure. So they're also monitoring what we might call the other side of the coin, the monetary flow that matches the real production. And what about the money supply? Well, just ask the Federal Reserve because they're busy trying to prevent this. They're trying to prevent the inflation of the money supply uh, such that it outpaces the growth of the real sector, the real economic activities with the trophic structure. And conversely, they don't want to maintain a money supply if the real sector is declining. So that, the Fed is all about balanced growth, where the money supply is sufficient, is the correct size to feed the flow of money, the monetary uh, value of GDP that's in balance with the real economic activity. So yes, they're fighting inflation, they're fighting deflation, they're for balanced growth and that's why we we know that GDP is such a good indicator of environmental impact because it has that trophic structure it depends upon a spreading agro-extractive base that has those obvious environmental impacts. And when we, when we understand the trophic structure thoroughly enough and the relationship of GDP to all that economic activity pursuant to the trophic theory of money, we can even say that or we can express carrying capacity in terms of GDP or even in terms of the money supply, the non-inflated or non-deflated money supply. Now there are some variables that affect the relationship between GDP and environmental impact. Inflation of course, which is readily accounted for. Technological progress, uh, not so much really because it comes from research and development which is one of the service sectors. So it's part of that trophic structure and service providers. It takes the generation of money to get the technological progress. So it's in no way disconnected from the trophic theory of money. It does have some uh, influence I think on the velocity of money. We'll get to that. We'll touch on it. 
Another variable is international trade. Places like Singapore and Hong Kong, they don't have a, a, a well-developed trophic structure. They're very active in exporting light manufacturers and services. So, you know, you have to be careful how you apply the trophic theory of money vis-a-vis -vis international trade. There are a number of policy implications of the trophic theory of money. I think the most important one is that the steady state economy means a stabilized GDP. And over the years, people have called for some type of indicator of the condition of the environment, and sometimes that uh, it's been put in terms of developing an environmental GDP. You know what? We have an environmental GDP. It's GDP, though to be more precise, it's inverse GDP, because we know that GDP expands at the expense of environmental protection. And a third policy implication is that um, even though it's very meritorious to uh, estimate the value of natural capital and ecosystem services, we have to be careful if we want to try to market that natural capital because just think what that entails. That means a new uh, type of expenditure that hadn't existed before. And uh, what this leads to is it, it brings us straight into the teeth of what we might call the trophic conundrum because as the natural capital stocks are declining, which give us the, the impetus to develop these uh, valuations. The supply curves are moving in and, uh, and we need more money then if we have uh, additional demand to account for the, the natural capital and ecosystem services in the markets. Problem is we have less natural capital at the base to generate the money so it backfires. It's a zero-sum game at the best, and with inefficiencies, it turns out to be a negative-sum game. There are plenty of research needs. I'll just mention three. Uh, we need to catalog the same sectors that the Bureau of Economic Analysis monitors and put those in trophic terms. Uh, then we will be able to develop the trophic scores of the economic activities in that structure and that's going to give us insight to uh, value added and prices in the basket of goods that we use to monitor inflation and that that'll be related to the velocity of money because it's probably the case where the velocity of money is a function of trophic development and uh, this would solve that mystery of well, does, is there some sort of natural rate of inflation? It's natural to the degree that the expanding trophic structure is natural. Now, of course, all bets are off in scenarios of collapse, uh, especially if you place your bet in monetary terms. I mean, that is the trophic theory of money. There won't be money for betting when all you have is agricultural and extractive activity trying to make a living. Uh, so I introduced the trophic theory of money in chapter 7 of supply shock and it'll be elaborated upon in the manuscript uh, for the Royal Society for the proceedings and um, I hope you enjoy the rest of the forum. Thank you. <laughs>